Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's all stand and give the Lord a hand. Let's give the Lord a shout. God's going to continue what he started last night. He's going to continue today. Praise the name of Jesus. I want, are, they on, are we on Facebook? No? YouTube. So I can welcome them. We want to welcome all you on YouTube. Praise God. Because it's going to be going all over the place. And so God is faithful. Amen. Are you excited? Well, you got up this morning and cut the, the blankets loose. Praise God. Well, I'm Pastor Eric. I'm the founder of Arise Men of God. And I tell you, God's been doing a lot of great things within the ministry, but especially men. I shared this last night. Last night, I was telling how now when I go on Facebook, I see all kinds of men's fellowships. I mean, they're rising up, fires all over the place, fire men coming together. And God is calling men to rise back up and take their rightful place in the kingdom of God. He didn't call us to retreat. He didn't call us to be comfortable. He called us to rise up as warriors and to take back what the enemy has taken from us. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Fernando. Come on. One of the things I, I love about this brother is that he's, he's so passionate. He lays it all out. He doesn't hold anything back, you know. And so I said, well, you know what, Lord, I'm going to have Fernando open up in prayer. So, brother, go for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise him. Let's praise him. Thank you, Father. You know, Brother Eric said, Fernando doesn't hold back. Let me tell you, I can't hold back. Somebody said yesterday, hey, your face when you're crying, it's kind of like, but you know what? It's all good because I do it unto the Lord because you don't know what the Lord's done in my life. You don't know what the, where the Lord pulled me out from. You don't know what the Lord's delivered me from. So you know what? These tears, these tears are a joy and gratitude because he has rescued me and saved me. And I can truly say that the chains of addiction have been broken. Hallelujah. You know, I had the privilege of dropping off my pastor yesterday. My mom sends me the word that I received yesterday. As soon as I dropped them off, my mom sends me this word, and I can't tell you what I, what I, I couldn't remember everything that I received. But when my mom sent me this, I began to hear this. And I know yesterday they came and I said, Lord, I want something. You want to hear your voice. I want to hear something different from you today. How I want, I just want the sweetness of your voice in my heart again. And he, she sends me the message, and the pastor comes and tells me, the Lord says, that it's not a mistake where I have you. That it's not a mistake where he has you. For you are a mighty man of God. I tell you that. One of the favorite stories in the Bible is Gideon for myself. Because I counted myself out. I didn't think that. I'm qualified to do the things that the Lord has me doing. I didn't think that God would use somebody like me to do the things that he has us doing. So this morning I woke up and I was already having church in my house. My wife came home from a, working a graveyard shift. I'm over here trying to worship in the shower. I'm over here trying to shout in the shower. And I know she's going to get bothered. I know she's going to be upset. But I can't hold back for this. So much joy for God is doing something in our lives. But you have to step into this. I'm worshiping God because I know that my wife's about to go to this mountain and he's about to transform our women. He's about to transform our wives. But he wants to work with us here right now today. As I, as I, came, I was driving over here. I'm sitting there driving. And I'm already having church in my car. And he gives me this song where he tells me, wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide, that was me. 
I will wander from place to place to place to place. Look, chasing the dragon, chasing the skirt, chasing something. I wanted something. Wondering all the time, and I applaud you, man, that are, you are here on a Saturday seeking God's face, seeking something new. It says, wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide, a worried soul, this bag of bones, because I was so empty and dry. And I tried with all my mind, and I just couldn't win the fight. I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I just couldn't win the fight. You know when I want the fight? When I gave it to my God. And I just couldn't win the fight. And I slowly drifted away. And just when I ran a road, how many, how many of us hit that rock bottom? How many of us hit rock bottom and said, Señor, ya no puedo, I can't, Lord, no more. Father, I ran out of strength. I just can't do it without you no more, Lord. I ran out of road. And I met a man. He says, I met a man. I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. I felt that unconditional love, only the love that he can give. Man, and today I want to invite you. If you've been holding back, if you've been carrying stuff, and you, if you just want something new, I know the atmosphere has already been set up for you. All you have to do, listen to the, what the Spirit of God is saying, you have to be obedient. All you have to do, step into it. All you have to do is step into it. He did, not re he did not save us or rescue us to sit there and be a spectator. He rescued us, set yourself free. He broke those chains so you can lift them up. He, he delivered your feet so you can dance before him. So I invite you, men, to come on down and receive what the Lord has for you. Father, we thank you for this day, Father. We thank you, Father, for we're here to worship you, Father. And we say that everything that comes out of us, Father, is going to be to worship you, Father. And we will show, Father, that you have set us free. You have delivered us, Father, to give you glory, Father. To give you glory. And I glorify your name, Father. And I worship in the, the Spirit of God is saying, Arise, man. Arise, man of God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, just keep praising, just lift your hands to him right now. Oh, we welcome you. Oh, we welcome you. Yeah. All blessings. Last night, the man of the house, the, 
pastor of the church said, this is your guys' home too, so be at home. And when he said that, you know, it just was like, oh, man, I'm going to be myself. Then. <laughs> and I like to party like a Holy Ghost party. I like to wave my hands in the air like I just don't care. I like to just praise God as if he was the only one in the room. You know, I don't care what anybody really thinks about me. So please, men, don't hold back. The men of God, we hold back so much. But I can remember the day when I got free from caring what other men thought about me. And ever since then, I have been free. Once, once you don't care, so leave, your, so leave your seats this morning. It doesn't mean you have to come down here, but just get out of your shell and, and be free. Amen? All right, the church is alive.
Hallelujah. You know, sometimes I feel like we're those dogs in the front yard. You ever seen people put their dogs in the front yard? But they have a leash. And some of them have long leashes. And some of us still have that leash, but it's kind of long, so we, we have some freedom, right? But God wants to cut that leash off so you're free to go further than you've ever gone before. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting off that leash off, and I have no restraints in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I'm sorry, but I, I just don't want to apologize for the freedom that God's given me. Like my brother that opened up said, you don't know what God has done in his life. You don't know where, where he's been. You don't know there's a story, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not going to hold back, man. We're going to be the men of God. That We're going to be the first ones down on the front. We're going to be the ones that worship at night in our homes with our families and in the morning. Hallelujah. Feel it. I can hear the sound of the Lion of Judah.
song right great song we're excited but you know there's purpose to what we're doing Joshua and the battle of Jericho they were quiet I feel like we've been like that we've kind of had some years where we're just waiting on God I'm telling you it's the seventh right now it's the seventh year 
I mean, the seventh day. It's the sound now. Those walls of Jericho are going to come down. I'm telling you, so don't sing the song, but look at the walls. Look at the walls in your family. Look at the walls in our city. Look at the walls in the United States of America right now. Look at when we're singing, when we're roaring, when we're praising, God is arising and his enemies will be scattered and the walls will come down. Amen? I believe it with all our heart. Hallelujah. You know, part of being led by the Spirit is you don't know what to do next, but it's okay, right? But I know walls are going to come down right now, so we're going to let out a roar of praise. We did this last night, but I feel like we're going to do it again. I'm going to count to three, and we're going to let out a roar of praise like Joshua and his army in the battle of Jericho for walls to come down. And I'm telling you, you have to have faith to believe that the walls are going to come down. Amen? I have kids that are not following the Lord. When I roar, the walls are going to come down in their life, and the enemy has to let go of them, and they're going to come into the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Okay. You guys ready? One, two, three. obedient to the Holy Spirit, okay? But I feel like some of you need to summit the mountain. So if that's you, that means you need to climb the mountain and get higher, right? 
So this stage will be like the mountain. So uh, we're just gonna keep playing. And just like that guy, that was the confirmation for me. What, he just came up into the mountain and he went, yeah! If that's you, just come up to the stage and just summit the mountain, the mountaintop. Shout out. Come higher. Come up higher. Come on. that mountain climb that mountain summit that mountain this is a day to come to a higher place with the Lord amen this is a day right now seize the moment seize the moment the Lord said
It's a new army rising up. It's a new army rising up. Such a time to do. There's a new army rising up. There's a new army rising up. There's a new army rising up. It's such a time to do. There's a new sound rising up. There is a new sound rising up. There is a new sound rising up. Such a time as this. There are new songs rising up. There are new songs rising up. There are new songs rising up. Such a time as this. It's an army. It's an army who's gonna go deep. It's an army who's gonna go higher. It's an army who's gonna go deeper. It's such a time as this. It's an army who's gonna go deeper. It's an army who's gonna go higher. It's an army who's gonna go deeper. Thank you, Jesus. Just, just keep on right there, going deeper. You know, God in his mercy waits for us, but there's a time and there's a season. And God's God of time. And he had opened the altars. He had opened here and several of you stayed back. I'm saying this in love, Okay. But there was someone that was supposed to knock down the arrows 
and he didn't knock down enough arrows because he waited. Are you waiting for something to happen or let the walls come down before they're even built up? And in his mercy, God's mercy right now, he's giving you that are sitting back there, you got to love me because that's what the Bible says, to come up and go deeper. You can stay back there or you can come up. It's your choice. But they're going to continue to minister just for a few more minutes. This is your opportunity. Do not let it go by. Cries out to deep. Wanna go deeper, deeper than before. I wanna go deeper with you. Go deeper with you. Deep cries out to deep. Baptize me in your fire. I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper. Baptize me in your fire. Baptize me in your fire. I want to go deeper. surrender beyond lyrics it's beyond music it's God himself God himself calling you to the altar this man right here Joshua 
is a worshiper of war for God. He wars in the spirit. And I encourage you guys to war for your family. To war for your children that are backslidden, that are lost, that don't even believe anymore. To war for your marriage. To war for your health. To war for your mindset. You got to do something different. It's beyond the lyrics. It's not even about the lyrics. It's not even about the music, though it is good. It's about your heart. You're a warrior. You're a fighter. You're a fighter. You made it. You're a fighter, Ryan. That's why you're here today, because you fought. You guys got to come up. There are your breakthroughs on your step. It's not fear, it's faith. Taking that first step. You got to battle for your daughter. You got to battle for your children because the devil ain't playing no games. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy, and he will take you out. You got to raise your hands. You got to worship God. You got to let go. Let go of that pride. Let go of that stubbornness and let God do his thing. In Jesus' name, cry out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You know, thank you, Pastor Angel. See, sometimes we don't understand how the flow of the prophetic goes. And that opportunity we have to do something unusual, to do something we're not used to, lifting up hands, getting at the altar. Let me, let me share. Come here, Juan. Let me, let, let me tell you what's unusual. See, let's turn this way. See the back of our heads? We're different. He has no hair. I have a ponytail. Thank you. But we worship God. We worship God. And I love worshiping him with Juan. His sons. Don't lose that opportunity. When the door opens for you to come in, and do something that they're not used to or normal, do it. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you. Let's give the Lord a hand. You know, we, we ran a little over, but you know what? That's okay. You know what? Sometimes it's like, oh, man, they've gone a long time. I tell you. In the God's presence, why would you want to get out of it? Praise God. But I'm going to have uh, right now Pastor Angel come up. And, uh, let's give a hand for this man of God. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> wow.
welcome, guys, to Turning Point Fellowship. Welcome for a, a part of a, a Rise Men's Ministry, uh, what God is doing in our lives. Uh, every time you spin, God is knocking things off your shoulders. Every time you raise your hands, you're getting rid of some weight. Just coming into the presence of God, changing your life, that today your life could be changed. All you got to do is believe and it can happen for you. But right now we're going to go ahead and receive our, an offering for a rise men of, of God. Amen. Now don't look at it like, oh, these guys are always asking for money. This is an opportunity for you. As you bless the house of God, as you bless this ministry, God's going to bless you. It's not, the, it's not the amount you give. I've learned this. I've been in ministry for 28 years. It's not the amount you give. It's the condition of your heart, how you give. If you give a quarter, God will bless that quarter. If you give $25, God will bless that $25. If you give $500, God will bless it. Don't think you can out, ever outgive God. It blew my mind when I first gave $500. It blew my mind when I gave $1,000. i am giving to God in a regular service. It blew my mind when I gave $3,000. It was blowing my mind, but God kept increasing me. And it blew my mind when I wrote a $10,000 check to the, to the ministry. Some of you guys have never even thought of things like that. But I, I wanted all of God, and I still want all of God. When I got saved, I said, I want everything that you have for me, I want it. And he says, we'll see. And here we are. God has blessed this man. And I'm not bragging or boasting. I'm bragging and boasting in the Holy Ghost because he's the most in Jesus Christ. Amen. So I encourage you guys to give. Give from your heart. I'm going to show you guys a. A little Latin thing, a Hispanic thing. Don't be. In the Hispanic community, they know what I'm talking about. Don't be a tight one. Don't be a codo. Don't be a codo. We've gave to many things. I gave to drug dealers. I gave to bars. I gave to strippers. Come on. I, I gave to all those things all the time when I was out there in the world. And for me to give to God is an honor. It's a pleasure. So give out of a grateful heart. Give out of a thankful heart for what the Lord has done. Raise your hands. These men will get you an envelope. Amazing God you
God. I'm going to have Josh pray for the offering. Father, you are beyond amazing. So, Lord, we give all that we have, which is not enough, but we give all that we have to you, Lord, and we give this tithes and offering to you, Lord, that you might take it beyond what we can do supernaturally, Lord. Do amazing things, God, for your kingdom's sake, we pray, Lord. We bless it. May it multiply for your kingdom, Lord, that you might do greater things. And we just expect powerful things to be done, Lord. And we expect beyond amazing things to happen to those who gave today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Where's Hugo? Praise God. You may be seated. Uh, I got to take just a little more time because, by the way, when I minister, I don't, I don't take any of the offering. I just do it because I love God. You know, and so, but these ministers here, they don't come for the money. It's not a lot of money, <laughs> you know, in ministry, but they come. And they give, and for the fellowship, and they give so much. Praise God. But uh, we're going to do something. A, uh, a couple of years ago, um, a couple of years ago, we, God put in my heart, so many things God has put in my heart, like the dog tags and stuff like that. And, and he put in my heart to, uh, every time we go to a church, we recognize what we call a man of the year. Because Newsweek, sports, they have men of the year, right? But why doesn't the church get some of their men from the congregation and say, you know what, you've proven yourself. You're, you're, you're a good husband. I said, a great one. We're a good one. You serve in the church. You're dedicated. Why We should do that more often. So what I do when we go to churches, I nominate, you know, I talk to the pastor as I talk to Pastor Angel. And, we, and he came up with the name of a man of the year. Now, for me the, here, because I'm part of a Turning Point, it was hard because, man, I know now some of you, like Thomas and Juan and Eric and, and, and so forth. I know them, and I go, man, you could pick any one of them to be man of the year, you know. So I know that, Pastor Angel, it wasn't easy. You're all men of the year. Praise God. Uh, but, um, yes. And so, uh, so, can someone go get uh, Mr. Ryan Eldridge from the back? Yes. And I'm going to have uh, the ministers come up put with me, uh, Pastor Angel, uh, John. Just stand up here with me. selected as man of the year. You had tough competition, but uh, he's the only one that paid me $50 to get it. <laughs> but it. But it really was not easy to pick in this group of men a man of the year, but you were selected. Ryan. And I remember, Ryan, the first time I, I came, we were at the beach, and this brother walked me to the, uh, to go shower, go change. He took care of me, and yet he didn't know me. That's the kind of servant this man is. You know, and so it says, Certificate of Recognition, this award is to Ryan Eldridge, 2022 Man of the Year, Turning Point Fellowship. Pe he has achieved high standards of being a man of God as a Christian and a husband. 
And so we award you this. It's signed by myself, you know, whoever. I know I didn't take better handwriting in school, you know. I don't <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. And uh, no one ever takes me out, but maybe you'll be the first. But here's a gift card for Black Bear. And so I want all of you to lay hands on him. and <laughs> Yes, bifold. You can, you can turn around, turn around, Ryan, so that. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for Ryan. I thank you for the anointing that breaks yokes and sets captives free. I thank you, the Lord says, son, because of your servant's heart, I will raise you up as a leader in my house. To, not to lord it over people, but to serve people. Because I'm looking for servants that have my heart. And, and the Lord says, you've been faithful with the little, now I'm going to make you ruler over much. And much is given, much is required, but I won't give you more than you can handle. You just don't know how much you can handle yet. But I'm going to bring much to you because you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And God says, I will honor you as you honor me. I will lift you up as you lift me up. I will take care of your house because you've taken care of my house. You've honored my family, so I'm going to honor your family. And God says, don't look where you came from. But know that I have plans for you that are bigger, exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask, think, or imagine. He says, so start asking bigger. Start thinking bigger. Start imagining bigger. And watch me move on your behalf because you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the anointing that is resting upon his life, upon his heart. That, Father, it's evident that when you pick a man out of obscurity and you start bringing him to that places of the threshing floor, Lord, he's been threshed, he's been pressed, he's been plucked by your hand. You chose him before he chose you. You loved him before he loved you. And Father, we thank you that the best is yet to come. So Father, we just ask for that anointing that you've deposited on the inside of him. From the press, the olive press, comes the greatest oil of your life. For not just you, but for others. To anoint them with the oil of gladness. That you know what it's like to be man of the year. But there's other men that you'll stand with and lift their hands. Because you know you are not qualified. But God don't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. In Jesus' name. Father, we know that as a man humbles himself, you exalt him. You lift him up. Father. So, Lord, we praise God. We praise you for Ryan and his life and his example, Lord. We pray that you would continue to be that example, Father God. We know that um, Moses was on the backside of that desert, Lord God, and you were preparing him for something great. So, Lord, as we bring Ryan to you, we thank you for his life. We thank you for his heart, that you will continue to bless him and keep your hand upon him, Lord God. Lord, You've anointed him. You, you've called him to go out to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, Father. And, Lord, to proclaim, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord God. Lord, use him as a vessel of unto honor and that you will continue, Father God, to help him, Lord. Lord, I, I think of as Jesus told Peter, Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. And when you're converted... You go and you strengthen your brethren. So, Lord, may he strengthen the brothers around him, Father God, that, um, that this day wouldn't just be a day of recognition, but it would be a day that he would use it for your glory to touch other men's lives, Father, to um, just to see their lives transformed and touched, Lord, for your glory. We thank you for him in Jesus' name. I 
love you. I love you, my brother Ryan. The Lord would say, well done, good and faithful servant. The greatest call of all is being a servant of the Most High God. This is a payback from the Lord. For all the trouble you went through, for all the stress and all the battles and all the trials you were tested in, the Lord says, well done. Now, receive the anointing, the double for your trouble. Here it is. Well done. Be blessed, Ryan. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Stay up here, uh, Steve, please. Please indulge me, people, brothers. Uh, right here. I never get a chance to take a picture with the guest speakers, okay? <laughs> and since I have them up here, guess what? Praise God. Amen. You may be seated with, without further ado. I know we had a lot of stuff happening, but you know what? I, I've learned one thing. I used to, we used, as a minister, you pray, Holy Spirit, have full control of the service. And then as soon as we say amen, we say as the Holy Spirit, sit back right here. I got the agenda. I know what to do. And then after the service, thank you, Holy Spirit. Come on up and thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, if we really want the Holy Spirit to flow, we need to let them flow. We need the Holy Spirit to flow with such musicians as people. Let's give a hand to these musicians, man. Hey, Josh is from Corona. Where's Mike uh, Culver from? Fresno. Fresno, somewhere up north. He came down here. The, 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 the tall brother? Pastor Robio. Okay, what did he say? He just moved He just moved to Pastor Robio. Mike from Riverside? <laughs> and I don't know where my, oh, there he is. No, where is he? He looks like my brother-in-law, Alfred. Uh, he's from L.A. And, and, and you know what? They don't practice until we come together for what, but they have a heart of worship. And they make the time to come. They came last Friday during traffic time. They came. There was nothing in store for them, but they got together for you men because they wanted to give you the best. And so I call them the Arise worship team. For Arise men of God, they're the Arise worship team. And God has just blessed us. So praise God. I want to introduce one more person. He's my nephew. He, I've known him since he was a baby. I, you know, I, I used to go pick him up, and it's, and it's my sister, which is his mom. And, they, and him and his sister would be at the door. Uncle's here. Come on. we got to get out. Because I, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But, you know, they, they created, I created a good habit because now they're on time places, I hope. <laughs> Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand for John Guzman. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Well, good morning still. Good morning, guys. Great to uh, see everyone here. It's always great to see men come together and, um, you know, seek the Lord, call upon his name, and you know, I was just thinking about those walls as um, Josh was mentioning about the walls, right? The walls of Jericho. And I think it's the perspective that we have. And we see walls, but from heaven's perspective, it's a line in the sand. It's a line in the sand. And it's our perspective upon those walls that makes the difference. The walls will be there, but let's get heaven's perspective 
of what those walls really consist of. And God could conquer those things. He's able to overcome anything that comes into our lives as we seek him and draw near to him. So you guys could be seated. It's great to be here. Um, just want to kind of, uh, as I jump into this, you know, there's a couple things. You know, today's a, a significant day, actually, if you guys think about it. May 14th, 1948, God was faithful to his word, Ezekiel chapter 37. Israel was declared a nation. A big deal, man. Big deal. Right? Those dry bones. We sang, there was a song last night that was mentioning about the dry bones. And, and I was reminded, today is that day that God breathed life back into the nation of Israel and put them back into the land. We're waiting for, right, he's re, he's, they, they've returned to the land, but we're waiting for that regeneration to take place as well. So just say that because God is faithful to his word. So my name is John. I, I, I'm married. I've been married for about 24 years. Most of you guys don't know me, so just so you guys kind of know where I'm coming from. I have three kids, 30 years old, 22 15. I got two grandkids. Where's the grandpas? In grandpas, right on. Hey, shh, what can we say, right? Grandpa is where it's at, man. That's a, it's a great thing. Got to get a second job, you know, um, just, to, just to keep up with them and, and all the spoiling that we do with them. But, you know, I got saved and, and found my ministry foundation there at Calvary Chapel Downey. That's where I'm, I, 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 I kind of was raised up, if you will. I, I was part of a church plant. For about 15 years there in the city of Pico Rivera. And then I recently just came back to where I came from. And I'm there at Calvary Chapel Downey just kind of serving and just kind of waiting again. And just waiting for the Lord to uh, really give me that direction. But it's been a sweet time. It's been a great time uh, being back there at the fellowship. So here we are today. I want to kind of go with the theme that we're my, um, <laughs> I'll say my uncle, uh, that Pastor Eric, um, that he came with, with the counting of the costs. Counting the costs. I want to stick with that theme. And I got three things I want to share with you guys this morning. Three things. One, the first one is the commitments. Counting the costs. There's a commitment that comes along with that. Secondly, there's a call. There's a call that we need to consider. And then thirdly and lastly is the cup. The cup, we got to consider the cup. So those are the three things I want to look at. The first one is found there in Luke chapter 14. If you guys could, if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Luke chapter 14. I want to look at this and consider what Jesus uh, has to say regarding counting the costs. And as we turn there, let's go ahead and just ask God to go before our time right now. So Lord, we do pray and we ask as your word goes forth. Lord God, that you would touch these men's lives, that you would move by your spirit, Lord God, that um, by your word, through your spirit, you would minister to us as we come to this place, as we open your word. We draw near to you, Lord God, and we know as we draw near to you, you're going to draw near to us, God. So we thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen. So Luke chapter 14, verse 25, notice... Jesus, it says, now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them. So Jesus' following has grown greatly, right? right? Any leader uh, would be super excited for this following, multitudes. You know, and, and during Jesus' ministry and his time, he would woo them by his teachings, by his miracles, but eventually he would challenge them. He would challenge their commitments, whether they were wholeheartedly following after him. And this is where we see in this portion, and this is what he's going to do. He's going to challenge them to their commitment. And the first thing we see is that he challenges their love for him versus their love for all others, even their own lives, as we'll read. There in verse 26, as we read it, it says, if anyone, Jesus says, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. Interesting, right? The word hate is used. 
And that word is basically to love less. Right? It's a comparison word. Right? In other words, your love and devotion to those closest to you should be less than your love and devotion for God. Right? No family ties or anything should be distracting you from the path of the full obedience that the Lord has for you and has set before you. But he also says even to hate his own life. Even his own life. Not not just to love less those around us, but even our own lives. Jesus cuts deep, right? Oh, I can... You know, I may not have too many people that are around me that are close to me, so I, I'm pretty good in that area. But wait a minute. Now my own life? Now he hits home. Yeah, my comfort, my safety, my self-centeredness takes the back seat in comparison to bringing glory to his name. That's what he wants. So first... Right? For those who want to follow Jesus to be a true disciple, we're to love God supremely even over our own lives, even over our own comforts. And here's the neat thing. As I do that, as I, as I put God first and supreme in my life, supernaturally, I become a better husband, <laughs> a better father, a better son, a better friend a better servant of God. A transformation begins to take place. A renewing of my mind goes on, and those around me are the recipients of that transformation. As I put God first, as I put him supremely. Not only this, as we continue on in verse, 20, in verse 27, check it out. It says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. This cross is the instrument of what? It's the instrument of death. That's what it was used for. It was an instrument for reproach. Right? Reproach means that you're open to rebuke. Right? Open to rebuke. That's what, that's what it means to have this cross. It's a cross that, that was suffering. There was suffering was involved. And also, there's loneliness that takes place. Loneliness, right? Remember, what did Jesus say as he was there on that cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Not everyone is bearing their cross around us, man. So if you feel lonely or an outcast at times, you know what? Good. You should feel like an outcast. When you're out in the workplace or in doing their thing out in the world, you should feel if you don't, something's wrong, my friend. Right? The Bible says, come out from amongst them and be separate, says the Lord. So if you feel or you try to fit in, man, we don't, that's not the direction you want to go to. Jesus continues and he gives two illustrations here. Two illustrations. He gives us two illustrations of counting the costs. And he looks at this building project and this war, if you will, and preparing for a war. Notice verse uh, 28, he says, Which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first to count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. We don't want to finish. Like that, right? It's like brother was praying, man. We want to hear those words. Well done. The good and faithful servant now enter into the joy of your Lord. And it continues on in verse 31. Or what king going out to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while they're, while they're still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. And then here it is again, verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, can, he cannot be my disciple. So it's rather clear. It's rather clear. In order to be a disciple, a follower, or learner, 
God needs to be first. We are to love him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. But what happens? What happens to us? We start off this way. What happens? We get busy. And as it's been said, what does busy stand for? Being under Satan's yoke. Right? Being under Satan's yoke. We get busy. He told the church of Revelation this. this is what, they, they were doing well. He commends them for a lot of things. This is what Jesus says to the church of Ephesus. He says this in Revelation chapter 2. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and they're not and found them to be liars. Verse 3. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Man, you've stayed the course. You've been doing well. Nevertheless, uh uh-oh. I have this against you. That you have left your first love. It could happen. It could happen. And God's bringing us back. God's bringing us back saying, let's get this back in order. Things are out of order. When things are out of order, you know what happens? Chaos. Chaos happens in our lives. Get things back in order. So this genuine love for God and for each other was replaced by work there in the church of Ephesus. That's not what we want. So there's a commitment we need to consider. But we also, moving on, yes, there's a commitment, but there's also a call. There's a call that God has put before us. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 19 with me. I want to look at this together. 1 Kings chapter 19. Quick little background. You guys are familiar. The great prophet Elijah, right? Just... Uh, executed the 450 prophets of Baal, right? He prayed for rain because there was a famine in the land, right? You guys recall that. But then what? But then a woman comes and threatens him. And there he is. He finds himself running for his life, and he he hides himself there in the cave. And God comes and speaks to him. And God says, Elijah, your ministry is going to continue. He talks about two kings and they'll bear the sword from him. But he also says this third person, this is what we're going to look at. And he, he now answers that call and he follows after what the Lord has for him. We'll pick it up in verse 19. We'll read verse 19 through 21. It says this. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Sabat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the twelve. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elijah turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment. And, it, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. So notice verse 19, first and foremost, uh, Elijah finds Elisha plowing. He's working. Before he's called, he's working. And I like that because it's been said you can't what? You can't steer a parked car. You, you got to be moving, man. You, you got to develop this heart of a servant as we just acknowledged our brother. Having that heart of a servant and, and to be a worker. You know, Paul identified himself. I think of Romans chapter 1. Paul, he says, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. A doulos, a slave. He was a worker. Paul worked. He was a hard worker. And I think we've lost that, right? We're, we're, or we've, we're losing it. Hopefully not us. But young men, there's young men in here. Man, develop just a, a, a good work ethic in general, in anything that you do. Yes, in church is great. It's awesome. It's a blessing. But even out there, it's a witness to the world, man. It's a witness to the world that you have a good work ethic. 
It's just part of you. It's part of your DNA. And then God's people are able to benefit it from it as well. Right? Mark chapter 10, verse uh, 44 and 45. For the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. He who desires to be first shall be last. Right? And become a slave to all. So he, he's plowing. But then we see Elijah throws this, his mantle over Elisha. I love it. What a great picture of that. This mantle would have been a large, hairy, overcoat garment. Right? Probably stunk, probably smelled, probably sheepskin or something, right? Probably not very pleasant. But the meaning of this is that God has called you, Elijah. Elisha. He's called you to serve Elijah, to be his successor. It's a calling. He's now identifying that, hey, God has called you. But notice what Elisha, notice how he responds in verse 20. This is what Elisha does. He said, it says that he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. Interesting because in the New Testament, doesn't that sound familiar? Right? Because over in Luke chapter 9, I'll, I'll read it to you guys. They said this to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go bid then farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to them, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So what's the difference here? What's the difference between these New Testament guys and Elijah? Elisha. Jesus saw in the New Testament, he saw that it was just a delay tactic. There were excuses. He saw right through it. But with Elisha... Elisha proved his wholehearted commitment to answer this call by his actions that he did afterwards. Look at verse 21. Look at verse 21. This is what he did. So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment. Elijah throws himself a farewell party for himself, right? But he uses the oxen and the equipment. How did he prove his wholehearted commitment to answer this call? By killing the oxen. Oxen weren't cheap back then. If you had oxen, you were rich. You had it going on. And here's the other thing. He's using his equipment, which was obviously wood, as fuel to cook <laughs> the oxen. Elisha, here's the thing, follow me here. Elisha had no intention in taking his hand off the plow and then going back to it. He had no intention in doing that. He had no intention. And man, listen. What bridges do you need to cut off? What bridges? Elisha burned his bridges. What bridges, guys, listen. What bridges do you need to cut off? What bridges do you need to burn in order to fully walk in the call that God has for you? What's keeping you back as we've been talking about? What's holding you back from that call, the answering and walking in, is it that ungodly, unequally yoked relationship that you're in? What is it? Maybe it's that hobby, man. And I hate to say this, maybe it's video games. Maybe it's just a continual pattern. You're on that hamster wheel of bad habits and sin, man. You know the things that are getting in the way. I, I, Hebrews, I love what Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 12 says, let us lay aside every weight. You know, the weights, and he says, and the sin. The weights are the gray areas, right? But as you know, what makes gray? Black and white. It's not, eh, it's one of those, eh, it's not that bad. 
to wait, man. As my uncle was talking about running yesterday and the, 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 the baton. You can't run with weight. It's going to slow you down. And he continues. Let me finish the verse. He says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What's slowing you down to answer your call that God has put before you? Paul says that we're to present ourselves as a what? As a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Man, we get to serve him. We get to walk in this call. It's not a burden or a weight to serve. It's an honor and a privilege. It's what it is. It's a blessing. Because time's short, man. <laughs> Let us be about our Father's business. It's been said, and I heard this quote, life is like a dollar bill. You get to spend it once, so spend it well. Right? That's it. It's a dollar bill. You got one to spend. Use it well. Answer the call. Go after it. So as we count the cost and we consider the commitments, we consider the call, I want to consider the cup. What's the cup? I want to consider the cup. Turn back with me. Sorry, back to Luke chapter 22. We're going to look at this cup and... In Luke chapter 22, it's that scene there in the Garden of Gethsemane. But in order for Jesus to fulfill what he was sent to accomplish, he had to consider the cup. And for him, it was the cup of wrath, right? Bearing the sins of the world, being beaten, spat upon, bearing the cross, being nailed and crucified crucified to this cross. And we know here in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was faced with the reality of what was before him. He was faced with it. Look at it. Chapter 22, verse 39, we'll read to 42. It says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and prayed, saying, here it is, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So if there's any other way for mankind to be reconciled back to you, God, man, take this from me. If there's any way for sins to be atoned for, take this cup. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours be done. You see, man, listen. This cup was specifically prepared from the Father for Jesus. This cup was not prepared for anyone else. It wasn't Peter's cup. It wasn't John or James or any of the disciples' cup. It was designed and prepared for Jesus. That's who it was prepared for. And Jesus knew this, right? Prior to, over in Matthew, I'll read it to you guys. Over in Matthew chapter 20, they're, they're talking about who's going to be the greatest, right? Who's going to sit on his throne? And Jesus says this. He says, but Jesus answered them saying, you don't know what you're asking, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We're able. Jesus told them, yeah, you'll drink from my bitter cup. And, and if you look at that and you consider what's taking place, they did suffer. <laughs> History says that these guys did suffer. But it wasn't like they suffered. It wasn't the suffering in, in comparison to what Jesus went through. It was different. So... This cup was prepared for Jesus and Jesus only. And likewise, man, listen. You and I, God has prepared a cup for us. Maybe you've already have partaken of that cup. 
Maybe it's a cup that is being prepared that you have yet not to take of. I'm not talking about cups that we created ourselves through foolish mistakes and bad decisions. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about a God-prepared, a God-given cup that's been placed into your lap. It's that cup. Has there been a cup prepared or given to you? Maybe it's a spouse that wants out, man. Unforeseen financial troubles, division in the family, disease and death. What is that cup? What is the cup that God has put before you? You see, you may look at me and say, oh, this guy looks like he's got it under control and all, you know, he's got a pretty easy life. Well, you know what? God served my family and I a cup. And we're still partaking of it today. We're still in it. It was a big cup and it's not empty yet. We're still partaking of that cup. I remember my wife when we first entered into this, and I'll just kind of share about that. She, she shared this with me, and she said, you know what, honey, this is our cup. This is for us. It's not for anyone else. And this is where I, God spoke to me and, and, and has taken me to this passage. This is our cup. It's been designed and prepared for us. But we're still going through it today. Eleven years ago, the doctor said, well, for my daughter, who was four years old at the time, my daughter Grace, the doc said, it's either leukemia or aplastic anemia. I didn't know what aplastic anemia was. So obviously we, we say, well, which one do we not want? He said, you don't want aplastic anemia. What? <laughs> we want leukemia? We, we want cancer of the blood for my daughter? Yeah, you want leukemia. Because we don't know enough about aplastic anemia. Well, she ends up having aplastic anemia. And after being in the hospital over a year and a half, seven months, our longest stay straight, she was worse when she came out than she was when she went in. During the treatment for her aplastic anemia, aplastic anemia is failure of the bone marrow. Your bone marrow is your blood manufacturer. That's where your blood is made, designed. God's designed our bodies amazingly. And your bone marrow consists of white cells, red cells, and platelets. It's a yellowish type of um, uh, blood product. That's what your bone marrow produces. My daughter's bone marrow shut down for no reason. They don't know why. And through the treatment of restoring her bone marrow... She had a major reaction to it, and her brain ended up swelling, and we almost lost her. She almost went to be with the Lord. It was a horrible day. So not only did we have this bone marrow issue, but now her brain has swatted, and they're saying, you know what? Um, Mom and Dad, uh, don't expect much. She probably will be blind. She probably won't be able to hear, and she'll probably stop speaking. It wasn't a good day for us at all. It was a horrible day. Now, almost the anniversary, uh, May 18th, 2011 is when we found ourselves there in the hospital. Um, almost 11 years later, she's special needs. She's full on special needs. She can see, she could hear out of one ear, but she's nonverbal. She was a perfectly normal little girl at four years old, man. Perfectly normal. And now she's nonverbal and has many needs um, that she needs uh, 24 hours a day. Now, I wish my testimony was, man, we prayed, the church prayed, and God just did something miraculous. I wish that was my testimony. But you know what? It's not. It's not. But God has given this cup, and he's prepared it for us, and he has served it up to my family and I. This is what we have received. At that time, I was serving. I was leading groups. I was teaching studies. People were coming to the Lord. We were doing 
great things, both my wife and I. And within days, here I am now in the playroom with a bunch of beautiful, bald-headed kids walking around with IV poles. From one thing to the next, serving God, great things happening, to now they're locked into a room 24-7. That was my cup. But the Lord spoke to me because, and, and brothers shared it. The Lord spoke to me because fear would grip my heart. It would grip my heart because whenever the future is unknown and you're in uncharted waters, fear could well up in your heart. Come on now, if you, if you don't have fear, man, you know, you need to do a class and teach us. But we're men and we get fearful. I had some fear and God said to me, John, is it going to be fear or faith? What's it going to be? And I said, Lord, it's going to be faith, man. You pulled me out. You set my feet upon a rock. You put a new song in my mouth. You've done a work. I'm going to trust by faith. I don't get it. I don't like it. But I'm going to trust that you know what you're doing. I'm going to trust, man. And this is the cost that some of us have to take. You may not have all the answers. You may not ever get the answers to your situations. But we trust God by faith that he knows what he's doing. I, 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 I've stopped asking, Lord, I, I don't know why. But I trust you. I'm clinging to you. So we see the cup that's before us. But listen, God has a big picture in mind. God has a big picture in mind. We see the wall. <laughs> but God has a big picture in mind. Think of Joseph and all the suffering and the challenges that Joseph went through. Right? You know his story. Right? I'm not going to go through it. You know he was up and down and in and out. He was in prison. All these things went on in his life. In the pit, in prison, raised up to second command. All these things that took place. But I love what it says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. It says, but as for you, telling his brothers, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. And here's the big picture. This is where God comes in. This is what God... In order, he continues, in order to bring about this day to save many people alive. He was placed there to go through what he went through, ultimately to save a nation. To preserve a nation. That's the big picture. God has a big picture in plan. Guys, listen. Our pain is not in vain, and God won't let us waste our pain when we put it into his hands. He won't. Our pain is not in vain, guys. But God has a plan. God has a big picture. Now, listen, if you're in pain right now, you need to know this. God loves you, man. Because, you know, one of the things that happens when you're in something that's heavy and you're going through it, you think, God, what happened? Right? The psalmist says, has your grace ran out? Have you left me? What's, what's going on? It's a human emotion. Know this. God loves you. God loves you, man. Amen. Know that. He hasn't left you and he won't leave you because he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But God also has a big picture. And those that are comforted end up what? Comforting. Because the same comfort they have received from God, they also are able to comfort. God has a bigger plan. God has a bigger plan than what we can see. But we want to put it in his hands. Jesus says this, and I'm done. Jesus says this, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Man, listen. Consider the commitment. Consider the commitment. Consider the call. Man, consider the cup because the end, in the end, we gain. We gain 
and we gain heaven. In the end, when we've counted the cost, when we've gone through the things, in the end, we gain heaven. Paul says, "Our for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these men. Lord, may you just continue to bless and pour out your spirit, Father. Lord, for any man here that is, man, Lord, they got a cup before them. A God-prepared and a God-given cup that's before them. Lord, may you give them your vision. May you give them the strength and the endurance. May you surround them with people who will love them and remind them and encourage them to stay the course. To stay the course that we weren't promised an easy street. We weren't promised a walk in the park, Lord God. We were promised to have challenges. Lord, help them to have the right perspective. This day we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Come on, somebody. Bless the Lord Jesus for that word. Hallelujah. I mean, he brought it home. When you start hearing the life story of somebody's tragedy that can go to triumphancy, then you start living from a greater place of faith. It's an honor to be with you men from the Arise Men of God. Would you guys put your hands together for the Lord for that. Amen. Of what God is doing here in the city of Santa Ana in the Orange County. It is great to be with you all. I, before I get started, I want to introduce two friends of mine that are here with us from the local area here. I have uh, my brother Billy Hogue right here. Would you guys put the Lord, put your hands together for the Lord and my other good friend. The original Jim Whitney right here in the house with us. Would you bless the Lord for them? Amen. These are my, these are my battle buddies that we go, while, while y'all men are sleeping, we're praying. Yeah, we get up early to pray. Six o'clock in the morning, we're on Zoom every Wednesday morning with the Mighty Men Movement. And we're seeking the face of God, praying for the nation, praying for personal prayer requests. So to have two of my... Battle buddies here, battle brothers, it's, it's a great honor. And also I do have my son Josiah who's with us all the way from, all the way from his mother's womb, but from Fresno, California. I bring greetings to you out of Central California. I've been married 19 years this year, have one son, been pastoring for 15 years. But some of you men went to the All In Conference. How many went to the, how many men were in the All In Conference that went? My God, I'm telling you, you guys showed up. Honest to God truth, you guys represented in this area of California. Come on, somebody. But I believe California is due for another move of God. How many can say amen to that? I believe California is due for another move of God in such of this era and this time with men just like you. That have been through the muck, the mire, the dirt, the bust, the disgust. That God adds that into your calculation to begin to elevate you and lift you up. So that you can fulfill the plan and the purpose that God has for you. But I'm so honored to be here with my dear friend, Pastor Eric. Would you guys put your hands together for Pastor Eric, who I love and honor. I would not be here today for some of the craziest prophetic words that this man's given me. Honest to God truth, he, 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 he acts like he's not prophetic. Prophet, he acts like he ain't prophetic. And he's done some of the craziest prophetic gestures in central California that nobody knew. And honestly, he's, he's like helping me build my trophy case with stuff he gives me on prophetic stuff he does. And, and I'm honored because uh, yesterday when he, he put the call out there, that we're going to run a marathon. I'm like, nah, I ain't doing it, man. I, I, I pulled a hammy, you know what I mean? If I, was to show, if I was to show you my picture, my brothers know because I showed it to them on the Zoom call. It's like somebody took an eight-inch 
wide paintbrush and dipped it in like solid purple and just went right in the back of my thigh. And But I'll, I'll tell you this, last night during worship, I was able to jump like I haven't jumped before in the last three weeks. <laughs> Honest to God truth, I'm getting mobility and movement since just being here because of the power of God's presence. How many enjoyed the word yesterday from Prophet Steve? Would you guys thank the Lord for Prophet Steve? My God. This guy don't own, know me from Adam's house cat, to be honest with you. And the word that he brought forth yesterday over my life and over my wife, him and his wife, Rosemary. I'm like, you just know God is in the house. Go with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 30. After the prophet spoke to me prophetically through the word of the Lord, I already had something written down and the Lord like erased it. During praise and worship, he starts speaking to me spontaneously. And I even told my brother Jim yesterday, he's like, what are you going to share? And I was going to go to when God told David to build an altar after he got done numbering the people. And all of a sudden there's pestilence and an angel shows up and starts leveling the playing field. And the Lord's like, um, the only way out of this, David, is if you build an altar. So he builds an altar, but he didn't want to take that piece of threshing floor from Ornan, the Jebusite, for free. You know, you know what happens, men, and nowadays when you want something for free that doesn't cost you, you'll never carry it with honor. Yeah, if I was to give you a million dollars for free, you'd waste it and blow it. But when you know that million dollars costed you something, you'll invest it in something wisely and you'll carry it honorably. And you'll see it multiply and increase at the speed of trust. Men have a problem trusting other men. Men have a problem. They know how to confess to God, but they don't know how to confess to each other. Because they're afraid that you're going to sometimes be look like a sissy, a chavala, a fluke, a flake. But I don't got time to go to rebuild an altar. Because as we were worshiping and praising this morning, and I began to hear the shout of men from the innermost part of their being. You don't realize, you may be shouting right now for right here. But the real battle is when you go home. The real battle is when you go to your work. The real battle is when you're, you're going through processing through stuff. Because it's easy to praise in the house of God. But how about getting your praise on at home? When your wife knows you better than the pastor knows you. Where your children know you better than anyone else knows you. When they know you in your good times and your hard times. They're still with you by your side. That's what makes you a man of God. That what makes you a warrior. That's what, see, what we do here is just adding for what's really going to take place out there. This is why it, it, it's, it's very convenient to come to meeting, meetings like this. But I really believe when God starts assembling men. That you, how many like watching movies? Don't act religious on me. Y'all see the movies. There's only certain movies I watch. I don't watch X-rated movies. I, barely, I rarely watch rated R movies, too, because I just, I, there's so much junk nowadays that is infiltrating. I'm like, I don't even have to look at a movie no more. Because it's like even social media is getting way out there and crazy and perverted. I was like, I, I don't got time for that anymore. Trust me, if, if you're spending more time on social media than you are in your prayer life, there's a problem. If you're spending more time scrolling through Facebook instead of getting in his book, there's a problem. There's a problem. You might, you might just be addicted to something than addicted to Christ. So we, we, we got to begin to put that stuff down. But, but there was a movie by the name of 300. And there was a portion in the scene of 300 where they're getting ready to go and face the Persian army of Xerxes. And, and literally the Persian army in that time was the biggest army that was infiltrating nations and taking dominations over territory. But yet when they came to, it was amazing in, in this movie is when they sent the messenger to Sparta. And the messenger decides to ride in with the heads of dead kings in his hand. Like that was going to scare Leonidas. Yeah, yeah. 
You see, the enemy will come to you with other defeated men's heads just to see what your reaction is going to be. And if, you, if the enemy can see a, any slight of fear in you, oh, he's going to breathe up all down. He's going to sniff you out, sniff you up and down, and he's going to know, uh, and he's going to find your weakness. But Leonidas just holds his ground. He looks at his wife. He don't even look at his men. He looks at his wife because there's something between a covenant between a man and a woman that God begins to fortify a whole nation. And Leonidas looks back at his wife and she gave him the look. And he reminds that messenger. And the messenger seen it. And that's when he gave him the kick into that pit and said, this is Sparta. And throws that messenger. He says, you can't kill a messenger. Watch me. You see, when the enemy comes to your home, you better recognize the knock. Either Jesus is showing up to knock on your door or the enemy is showing up to knock on your door. Before you answer the door, you better look through that hole. See, you're trying to get vision this big. But if you can recognize the enemy's vision from this big, then the vision of God will be greater. You see, yeah, I, I remember there was an old preacher, I think it was Lester Summerall, who said it. That the devil came by his bedside and tried to wake him up out of sleep. And he's like, oh, it's you. And he went back to sleep. <laughs> Don't engage unless you have to. You better choose your battles wisely, men. Because if you fight without getting a spoil, then you're just wasting your time in the fight. Because every time David was in a fight, he was about to get his reward. There's something about that. So when there's another part in the movie when now they're marching to go build that tremendous wall with 300 men. See, God don't need a lot of men. He just needs willing men. He just needs hungry men. Revival doesn't come with a lot of people. Revival comes with a core. It doesn't take a lot of, a lot of people. And, and I was thinking about this concept that if we were to gather just... Men in one city, men in another city, just hungry men, and begin to disperse them out. Can you imagine that if we were to gather men that were on fire and desperate for revival, we would overthrow this nation in less than a year. In less than a year, we would overthrow this nation in America. I'm not talking about going to the White House and, and trying to storm the White House. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, it, our help's not going to come from the White House. Our help's going to come from God's house. And when it comes from God's house, then we start seeing the nation change and be transformed. So when the, the 300 are marching, they meet these ragtag other marauders. And they're looking at, and Leonidas is like, their leader of the marauders show up. I think they were the Saxons. The leaders of the Saxons show up, and he's like, we want to go fight with you. He's like, that's good because we need more men. But let me ask you, who, who, who are the men that are with you? Leonidas asked him, who, who are your men? And he goes, well, I got a carpenter. I got a metal worker. I got this, I got that. And he's like, that ain't going to work because you're not trained. You're not ready. You're not prepared. You haven't done your homework. You haven't been to the school with neology. See, you're ready for theology, but you're not ready for neology. Because if God wants to see if you can carry the spirit and the truth... He's going to look to see how calloused your knees are. Because if you haven't built no calluses on these knees, then you haven't spent enough time with who he is. Because every time you bow before the holiest king of all kings and all the Lord of lords, he begins to empower you with his grace and with his mercy and with his spirit and arms you with his truth. So then Leonidas goes through all the lineup and he says, men, what is your profession? 
And he said, and you can hear them at a drop of a dime. They said, who, who, who? He says, this is our profession. They shared that they were street and they were ready to kill anything that opposed Sparta. Because they're like, we're not going to back down from a million man army. God don't need a million men. He needs 300. 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 1. It says, now it happened. Look to your neighbor said, it happened. Mm -hmm. When David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day. When you understand numerology, not from the place of mysticism or new age because they pervert it. The third day means something's about to arise. That the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were with there from small to great. They did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him and I'm not talking about going to get high because the soul, listen to this, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Beathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring me the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, which is faithful and true. And Father, we ask, Lord God, that you would equip our hearts and our minds. Speak to us with the spirit of revelation, knowledge, and wisdom. That, Lord, you get the glory for everything that is going to come, everything we're going to receive. Lord, we ask that you would... Let an angel of the Lord grab a burning coal from the altar of heaven to touch these lips of clay. That I would utter only what you want me to say, nothing more and nothing less. That you get all the glory for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Right here we are seeing the story, men, of King David who and his mighty men, 300 of them, maybe even more at this time, that were added to his uh, army, so to speak, and they were out taking care of manly things, and then they come back to home, and there was an enemy by the name of the Amalekites that had burned down their city, taken their wives, their children, sons and daughters captives for almost like a ransom, but to see what was going to happen next. Men, it's no different than what we are seeing in today's era. That we are seeing young men in the church nowadays, like these three young men, this young man, other young men that are in this building. But there is something that is happening in society that while men sleep, the enemy is so in terrors like never time before. That men, this is not a time to try to go to school again to come back to the place of the cross. Jesus already said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. And if we're not willing to count the cost of carrying that cross, then we're not ready to go and take back 
what has been defiling a generation that's coming behind us. We are already the old men. We're already the great haired. Whatever hair I got left. Hold on, let me comb my hair. But the truth of the matter is this. This portion of scripture is a prophetic symbolism of what is happening in our nation at this moment. Because we are dealing with an enemy that should have already been defeated. Because there was a king before there was David. There was King Saul who is what the children of Israel wanted because they wanted to be like every other nation. And they wanted to be having a king over them. And because they kept asking God for a, a king, finally God gave them what they wanted. But it wasn't the king that they should have got. And because they kept crying to God, God, I want a king. I want a king. They, they didn't realize they were already governed by the mighty God of all of heaven and earth was their sovereign God. And that wasn't enough for them. You want to know what happens when you don't understand who governs you? You will always want something less in your life instead of what God has already insta put into place for you from the beginning of the eon of time. So this is the problem is because when you want something manly, God's going to give you a heathenistic man. And because the nation of Israel kept bugging God, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. It's like we want a president, we want a president, we want a president. We want a prime minister, we want a prime minister. We want a queen, we want a queen. We want this, we want that. When they didn't realize what God already gave them was the best of himself. So then God gives them a king. But what was amazing is they should have went to the anointing service when they saw Saul anointed. Because Saul was anointed with a vial of oil. A little vial about this big. You, you knew eventually that oil was going to run out. And then he gets rejected. And the same prophet that anointed David is king. Samuel the prophet anoints David is, or anoints Saul as king with a vial of oil. Saul disobeyed God's commandment by telling him to kill all the Amalekites. You see, see, listen, men. What you don't kill now, another generation's gonna have to kill. Because now we're seeing the Amalekites that invaded David's territory. David was there when he should have killed the Amalekite king. This is why what you don't kill in private will kill you in public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, what you're not willing to crucify in private, don't expect a resurrection in public. Because it's going to be the very things that you're going to have to decimate and kill while nobody sees. Because David killed a lion and bear in private. Because when he killed a Goliath in public, it was on. You see, because you can do things in public to make yourself look good. But if you haven't killed anything in private, you're not going to kill no Goliath in public. And this is why when David had to deal with the Amalekites, he's dealing with an old generational thing that Saul should have killed. But because Saul was a king after the flesh, not a king after God's own heart, you always know what's going to happen. That's why sometimes, you want to know why David's greatest adversary was not his brothers, nor his Goliath that he had to face, nor was it the adulterous affair that he had. It's amazing to me because David failed once. Every la everyone labeled him as an adulterer one time. You don't see it again of him committing adultery again. And he paid the penalty horrendously. The woman he had the affair with got pregnant and that child dies. Next thing you know, his, his son starts raping his half-sister. Then all of a sudden, Absalom wants to steal the kingdom from him. All that was a payment because of what happened in that adulterous affair. But yet he only did it one time. Only one time. But now David is now dealing with Ziglag being burned to the ground. The name Ziglag means measure pressed down. 
I don't know about you men, because some of you have been so overly pressed that you have walked with a hunch in the spirit. Because you don't know how to stand in his presence. I'm not talking about my presence or the prophets or the fivefold ministry's presence. I'm talking before the one who David loved. Because David's name means love, which means also love token, which also means love to boil over. So there was something about David that nobody else had. See, everybody else has an excuse, but David had love. Everybody else may have looked head and shoulders that would play the part, but David was taking care of his father's sheep in the back field of the wilderness and singing songs to God day and night. What David was doing while men were sleeping, he was praying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, right now we need more men praying instead of sleeping. We need more men praying than partying. We need more men fasting than eating. We need men that are going to rise to the occasion and begin to cause a revival to take place in your family, in your home, in your marriage, in the school system, in the business system, in the church system, in all the systems of the earth. So when God chose David, he said, I found myself. That's why David was not anointed with a vial of oil. Someone was blowing a shofar. Where's that shofar at? Can can you just lift that up real quick? Can you just take that out of the sleeve real quick? I want want you to to see this. When when the anointing, can, can you bring that up here, sir? Can you bring that up here, Samuel? Thank you, sir. When, 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 the Samuel, when Samuel the prophet was commissioned to go anoint a new king, can you, can you imagine Saul was still king but with no anointing? He didn't even know that the anointing was leaving him to go be resting on somebody else because of his disobedience. Uh, listen up, man. If you're not willing to become a David... You just might stay a Saul. David's greatest adversary was not Goliath. It was Saul. And the only reason why David ran from Saul is not because David couldn't. Because you remember, the people were were saying the songs to David. Saul killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. If that wouldn't put a shiver down Saul's back. That David can take him out, I don't know what what would wake him up. But you got to remember that Saul may have played the part of the king without the anointing. Because the anointing, the, the prophet's word to Saul is he ripped the garment of the prophet, the mantle. Almost like on the mantle that Elijah passed to Elisha. And Saul, a disobedient man, rips it. And he says, this day, the same way that you ripped my mantle, God rips the kingdom from you and gives it to another. You better watch how you handle the anointing on your life. You better steward and count the cost of the anointing that God places on your life. Because all it takes is one fleshly thing to begin to dissipate the anointing off of you. So then the same prophet that anointed Saul, now he has to go find Jesse's house. And he goes head and shoulders through Jesse's sons and he says, this must be the one. And God said, no, no, no. Man looks on the outward appearance, but I look on the inward heart. And he goes through all the line and he says, you got another son? He's like, yeah, he's David. He's out there. See, See, David... He said, I was born into sin. I was conceived in sin. The scholars say they don't even know if David's mother was even the one that Jesse was married to. But yet, God sent the prophet to his house with a new vessel to anoint a new king. See, it's easy to settle for a little anointing. A vile anointing. But when God finds himself a David, 
he brings the best. Because the prophet comes into town, marching. You got to remember, when, when Samuel came into towns, the city would tremble. Uh-oh, is the prophet coming in peace? I mean, cities would tremble. One man made cities tremble. It wasn't one man. It wasn't Samuel the prophet. It was the God that backed up the prophet. So then he marches into Jesse's house and comes with the horn of oil. He says, this surely must be the Lord's anointed. Oh, the oil ain't flowing. Oh, wrong one. It, it was full of oil. You have to remember, when you look for the anointing, you got to wait until the anointing looks for you. Because he said, anoint me a new king and go to Jesse's house. So the anointing went to look for David while he was just minding his own business, doing his stuff. Then all of a sudden, the prophet shows up with a horn of oil. David shows up, and the oil begins to flow through a ram's horn. You know what this represents? A, a male ram had to die for this to be used for the anointing service for David. Oil will always find love. Where there's no love, there's no oil. Because you'll never honor the anointing he places on your life. So when the oil began to flow through a ram's horn, then all of a sudden, Josiah, will you take that back to this gentleman, this man of God? Thank you. When the oil began to flow down David's head, I had to take you back so we can come to Ziglag. Because he was anointed king, but the process to get there was great. You could be anointed for something. But you got to let God then train you. It's called training for reigning. It's called schooling for ruling. It's called destiny through distress. See, men don't like conflict. They don't like tight places. Because you're like, I can't flex. But this is what happened to David when he came to Ziglag. Because there was a measure being pressed down. Everything was taken. Everything was burnt. Everything was messed up. And he has two wives. I only have one wife, so I'm, not, I'm telling you, men, don't get two wives. Because your, your real wife will probably kill the other wife. You can't even manage two wives anyways. You can't even manage the one you got right now. You don't need two wives better come out of the closet if you got two wives because God will uncover he, he, he say I'm giving you I'm giving you uh, I'm giving you some some space here because I'm trying to give you a greater anointing I'm trying to turn you into the king like I chose my son David but now Ziglag has burned down to the ground the wives the sons the daughters are taken And he goes to his wife, Abigail, or they're taken, and Ahinoam, the Jizraelitis. A Jizraelitis is somebody whose names translated is God will sow. The Carmelite, Nabal the Carmelite, Carmelite means a doubly fruitful place. So David just didn't have certain wives around him. He had two that were prophetic for his life. Men, when you understand your wife, then you have to understand how prophetic she is connected to your destiny. Yeah, don't, don't downplay your wife and don't keep her in the closet. Don't act like she don't exist. Don't, you're, you're not just coexisting with her. You are in covenant with her. And because you're in covenant with her, there are more prophetic things God will add to your life just because you're married to her. So when you understand that sometimes your wife may be taken captive, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond when your sons are walking away from the Lord? Yeah, because something is now captivating their minds and their hearts to something else. 
This is why when David found out that his family was taken captive, he didn't go back as a king. He goes back to the original place of what he did when he was in the backfield of the wilderness. When he was taking care of his daddy's sheep. What's amazing is when you leave your family unprotected, an enemy will always come in. This is why as pastors, as ministers of the gospel, we never leave the sheep unprotected. Because if the sheep are left unprotected, a wolf can come. It's what's amazing to me is we always look at the sheep's and wolf clothing type of thing. I ain't tripping about a sheep and wolf's clothing. Because if the shepherd's there, the wolf will always die. But where there's no shepherd, because... The wolf will always kill the sheep. But when the shepherd shows up with the staff in his hands, he's going to break off that wolf every single time. So we see David in distress. The big D. But this conference is called to count the cost. David had to dig deep once his wives were stolen, kids were stolen, the city was burned down. We're not too far away from that in America, church. We already seen it with the riots that would happen and all that stuff burning cities down. People are flipping out, tripping out. But yet there is some men that God is raising up out of obscurity, out of the ashes, out of the places that nobody wants to address. So this conference to count the cost, the cost is an acronym is, are you willing to confess our soulish tantrums? Oh, oh, some of y'all men throw the biggest fits when things don't go your way. Mm -hmm. It's like you got bipolarism when you're at home. At church, you're the holiest dude. At home, you're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And you're like, brother so-and-so knows how to put on his precious Jesus face at church. But when he goes home, he throws soulish tantrums. You're going to have to repent for some of the stuff that you've done at home that your pastor don't even know about. So you're going to have to count the cost. Confess our soulish tantrums. But also another acronym for the cross or for the cost is this. You carry your cross of spirit and truth. C-O-S-T. Cross of spirit and truth. What's amazing to me is when you find a man that lives in the spirit and stands for truth, you become dangerous. But if you only like to praise but don't read the Bible, there's a problem. And if you only like the Bible but don't like to praise, you might be in Moses' church. Moses' church didn't like praise. They didn't. They, they didn't like praise. All they knew is, is the laws and everything like that. But they had a hard time praising. But in David's church, I don't know, you can't tell them not to praise. Because... When God finds a man that is gripped by heaven, that understands spirit and truth, you become dangerous. You become armed and dangerous. You become something that God can use as a weapon in his hand. Because if you're only spirit and no truth, you're going to blow up. And if you're only truth without spirit, you're going to dry up. But if you become a man of spirit and truth, you'll grow up. And you'll finally understand what it is to be a man of the kingdom of God. So we are living in a time that the world doesn't need to see the spirit and they just don't need to see the truth. They need to see spirit and truth merged together like the power of the cross. This is why the cross is so powerful. It's spirit this way and truth this way. And when you start carrying the cross of Christ on your life, then God's got your back and you just got to keep going forward. So another acronym for cost is, are you a carrier of supernatural transformation? You have to understand what's in you wants to ooze all around you. Christ in you wants to break. See, 
Jesus is dying to get out of you. He died to get in you. Would you please let him out of your life? Quit gagging him. Quit tying up his hands. Quit tying up his feet. Jesus does not want to be held prison on the inside of you. Some of you need to come to church with the joy of the Lord. It looks like some of y'all come with, because you've been baptized in dill pickle juice. Lord Jesus. Pastor, I got the joy of the Lord. Man of God, I got the joy of the Lord. Then notify your face. Lord Jesus. There's, there's too much hater stuff outside the world. We don't need to be hating in the church. Jesus walked out his father's will then paid the cost on the cross for us and died and walked out of the tomb of life. See, we look at everything Jesus did, but Jesus is like, I did it, so can you. The prophet said it, that Jesus is our brother. He's your big brother. Can you imagine when Jesus rose from the dead that he had to be the first fruits of the resurrection? That if anyone resurrected before Christ, it was trespassing. If anyone went into heaven with the Father, it was trespassing. So when Christ rose from the dead, it says in the Gospels that the graves were open and there were many seen in all of Jerusalem walking around at the same time. So can you imagine what they seen in Jerusalem of all the patriarchs and the matriarchs that were buried in a tomb, that when Jesus rose from the dead, we seen an epiphany of all these other saints that just manifested. And then it said that Jesus went and started visiting with the disciples for 40 days, pertaining and speaking to them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. After his resurrection. He's revealing himself to his disciples. He's revealing himself to Mary. He's revealing himself to all the ones. And no one can resurrect until first Jesus ascended back to the right hand of the Father. So they were having a Holy Ghost party in resurrection form. I'm going to close this up right here because he goes to a beathar. It's key who you hang around with. Uh, I'll tell you where you're going by letting me see who you hang with. Because if you're hanging with people that don't know nothing, ain't doing nothing, ain't wanting to become something, that's where you're going to hang out at. Because if you're not, they would say, well, well, you know, Pastor, I'm trying to reach him for Christ. You haven't even invited him to church. And you're saying, I'm trying to reach him for Christ. You haven't even brought him to a men's group. You haven't even, you, you haven't even said, hey, brother, can I, take you out to, can I take you out to lunch and can I invite my pastor? And you're saying, oh, I'm trying to reach him for Christ. If, the, if you haven't transformed them by now, bring another brother who will. Because two are better than one. One will put a thousand to flight. Two will put ten thousand to flight. See, 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 quit, quit trying to make enough excuses to draw out the process in which Christ wants to save them. Because your testimony might be shot. Yeah. Because if you're thinking about drinking with those that you're trying to win to Christ, hello? And one uh, on Sunday you're like, hallelujah, and then on Monday you're cussing with them. You're like, why, why would I want to follow you? Hello? We, we got to be real in these days. They get enough junk dealing with the stuff they're looking at. They're in bondage to pornography. They're in bondage to beating their wife. They beat their wife physically. They beat their wife with their words. They beat their children with their words. And yet they come to church. Oh, bless the name of the Lord, brother. Just be quiet and just get rededicated your life in the fire of the living God. So then David, whose love is boiling over because he's seen it and now everybody wants to kill him. But David remembers. He remembers. What was I doing before I became king? He wasn't even married. He had no kids. He wasn't running. He didn't kill a Goliath yet. He says, where's Abiathar at? Counting the cost is not trying to get you to go forward. 
It's trying to bring you back. We heard it. The kingdom of heaven on earth. We heard it. Back to your first love. Counting the cost before you can go forward, sometimes you got to be pulled back. A great archer knows the tension between the bow and that string. For that arrow to go farther, he's got to stretch it back as far as he can. But he keeps the eye on the target. In archery, there's the spotter. There's the spotter for that archer. And he's looking through his magnifying glass and he's saying, with the arrow, sin left, sin right. And that archer with the arrow is like, Ugh. he says, you're locked. Then he lets that arrow go. You want to know what the father did to the greatest son of David? That when Jesus went to the cross, he says, sin left, sin right. When the Roman soldier came with that spear, it was literally like taking that archery class and paid it in full. That Jesus didn't miss the mark with sin. You want to know why he had to cover all the bases of it from top to bottom to left to right to not give you an excuse to keep sinning. So I'm going to nail your hands so you don't keep using them for sin. I'm going to nail your feet so you don't keep walking out as sin. I'm going to you I'm going to nail your head with the crown of thorns so you don't think keep thinking sin like. Mhm. Mm I'm going to nail your back so that you don't keep looking at your past of your sin. I'm, I, 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 I'm going to beat you in the front so that you know when sin comes before you, you're going to overcome it. And a matter of fact, I'm going to finish it by placing this Roman soldier's uh, sword through you so that your heart does not become sinful. Jesus didn't miss the mark when he went to the cross. So when David came to Abiathar, and says, bring me the ephod. David could have asked for his kingly robe. But David said, no, I don't need to be a king right now. I need to be a priest. See, before you can be the king of your home, be the priest of your home. So he asked Abiathar, Abiathar, bring me the ephod, who is the son of a Himelech. Ahimelech's name means the brother of the king. But Abiathar's name means father of abundance. So he's asking father of abundance. Yo, brother, father of abundance right there in the black shirt, would you bring me my ephod? Because I need to ask the Lord something. See, David, you got to understand, when it's time to be a priest and a king, David was being a priest because he's got to inquire of the Lord. And when he inquires of the Lord, then he gets to execute like a king. But you see, if you don't understand both as priest and king, you'll never understand what it is to be the man that God has chosen in this hour and this season. You can't be one or the other. you got to be both and. So David is like, give me my ephod because I'm about to pray and seek and worship God for the answer. When was the last time you prayed? Now let me up it up. When was the last time you grabbed your wife's hand and said, let's pray together? When was the last time you grabbed your whole family and said, let's pray together? I'm not talking about at church. I'm talking about your real church. Your real, real dwelling place called home. Because Ziglag has burned. Your wives have been taken captive. Your kids have been taken captive, but you still have one more opportunity to call a Beathar 
the father of abundance. Go to, go to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to close with this scripture. And you're going to see why. David may have been a great shadow in the Old Testament. Jesus was known as the son of David and the son of Abraham. One is a picture of the throne and the other one is the picture of the land. That's why David was a man of the throne and father Abraham was a father of the land. So when we start looking at Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse number 44, this is the parable of the hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven. See, David had a kingdom that he ruled and reigned. He died young too. He died at 70. That's young. My friend Jim's older than 70 years old. I sat with Jim yesterday. I had to ask him his age, and I'm like, man, I want to be like that. Seriously. There's men you know that are older than 70. David died at 70. My grandfather died at 63. My dad had a stroke at 52. Thank God my dad's still alive and he loves the Lord, saved, sanctified, knows the word. You know, uh, the stroke may have his body, but the word has his heart. So in Matthew, the parable of the hidden treasure, again, this is Jesus, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it. He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What a parable that this kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man found and hid, which a man found and hid. David was coming back for Ziglag, but Ziglag was burned down. But his prized possession was his wife and his kids. The men's wives and kids. So I don't know what they were tripping about. They were in the same position as David. Yeah, all of them. All their wives and kids were taken. But yet they wanted to kill David? After David, they just uh, fought in battles and conquered victories. Now all of a sudden, all their wives and children are taken. And yet they want to trip on David. They want to flip on David and they want to kill him. Yeah, yeah. But yet this parable is the kingdom of heaven. Not the kingdom of David. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? He seen there was going to be an earth, a whole field that he's like, Father, I'll leave heaven. I'll sell, I'll give everything in heaven up. Just to come to the earth. To buy the whole field. Buys the whole field. This is why he chose you before you chose him. He loved you before you loved him. So he, for joy, he goes over and sells all that he has and buys that field. What, what a parable. That all along, Christ has been looking for hidden treasure. Verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he found, had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Close your Bible. We heard about David's kingdom. 
But the greatest kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. So when the word Jesus saw his father creating the earth, speaks it into existence. Then he creates man out of the dust of the earth, breathes the breath of life, and Adam becomes a living soul. Jesus is like, whoa. I'm willing to give all this up, Father, for the whole earth. In Egypt, he was a lamb for a house. Then he became a lamb for a nation. But when John the Baptist seen him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the field. Now he just upgraded his redemptive power. That he wasn't just a lamb for my family or for my house. Or a lamb just for Turning Point. Or a lamb for Covenant Worship Center. Or for the lamb for Calvary Chapel. Or the lamb for all the churches represented here. He says, now I'm a lamb for the world. The whole field. And he didn't stop there. Because when Christ died, he's like, now I was just one man walking in the streets of Galilee. Now I can multiply myself. And now I can live in the hearts of those that accept me as the king of heaven and the king of earth and the king of glory. Come on up, Brother Josh, and start playing. But all this time, man, you want to know why God sets you up for like this? It's not to beat you. It's to challenge you. We beat ourselves up enough as it is already. We're good at that. We shadow box. We punch ourselves in the face. Babe, look what has happened. As an excuse. And she's like, really? You want to know what my wife tells me when I'm not living the place that Christ wants me to live in at home? Ain't this true, son? Huh? Doesn't mama say, like when she, she's, you know, I'm not a pastor to everybody. I'm only a pastor to the ones that God trusts me with. The flock. I remember one time me and my wife were in heated fellowship. That means arguing. You know. We were in heated fellowship. And that wasn't heated intimacy either. But there's been times where we were angry and then we ended up being intimate. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Well, we were in heated fellowship and we were arguing. And she said, you ain't my pastor. Whoa. Stop me dead in my tracks, prophet. You ain't my pastor. We got a pastor. I was like, oh. She goes, I just need you to be my husband. And your son just needs you to be his father. Something right then and there, I got delivered. <laughs> I've never tried to pastor my wife again. I've never tried to pastor my son. I just accepted that I've been anointed to be her husband. Anointed to be his father. The heated fellowship. And then she ended with this after I was trying to throw a soulless tantrum. I had to confess our soulless tantrum. I was throwing a soulless tantrum. She sat there with the beautiful blue eyes, hands on her petite hips, and goes, and you call yourself kingdom? I took my kingly robe off. And I said, Abiathar? Where's my ephod? I need to pray. Men, you're not supposed to be like kings here. You're supposed to be like kings out there. 
because that's where the real battle's at. Right here is where you let God saturate your priestly garment as a kingdom of priests. This is why worship is so beautiful. It precedes the word of God. See, we think preaching is where it's at. Preaching is secondary. You want to know why? It's not eloquently how the prophet spoke or Minister Mendoza or myself spoke the word of God to you. You know what grips our hearts? Is when we see men worship. Because worship was always primary. If there was no sin, there would be no preaching. See, preaching is secondary. Because even if there was no sin, which, but there was. God didn't have to preach to Adam. He said, where are you? You can't tell me we don't serve a loving father. That even when Adam sinned and he runs from the presence of God, that God the Father was like, Adam, where are you? That even in his sin nature, he wanted to show him, I need to restore you. I need to repair you. I need to clothe you with skin. So he took an animal and killed it. God was always about redemptive work. This is the only reason why we have this. Was to take care of our fleshly nature. So even if there was still no preaching, Adam would still have to worship. Hello, David. You may have been trying to fight a battle when God really wants you to be a priest before you go and fight and take back. But I, some of here, there's some men here with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you've never confessed them to be Lord of your life, I don't care if you're old or you're young, but you're like, man of God, I've been to church, but I've never answered the call or counted the cost of why Jesus died for me. If that's you today and you want to give your life to Christ, would you please just stand and come to this altar and we will pray for you and we will pray with you. If you've never asked Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, if that's you and you would love to do that, we will pray with you. Now the other altar call is this. If you're ready to quit throwing your soulish tantrums and it's not that God is mad at you he's just trying to find the treasure he's trying to he's not looking at the dirt he's trying to look for the treasure that he put on the inside of you he's the merchant man and he's trying to find that one pearl of a great price called the king and the kingdom that he put on the inside of you. And if you're ready for God to discover that, because he's the one that put it there, then come stand in this altar and we're going to pray with you. We're going to minister to you. And I'm going to ask my friend prophet Steve. I'm going to ask Pastor Angel. I'm even going to ask Jim Whitney and Billy Hove to come pray for these men. Pastor Eric, come on up. There's enough men here.